what people in the media are talking about when they refer to Alan Lickman and his keys to the presidency. They are a fantastically predictive model of whether or not they will win. So, what are the 13 keys to the presidency? They are a set of 13 true or false questions that determine which party will get the presidency. If five or fewer of these keys are false, the incumbent party, whoever is currently in the presidency, Democrat or Republican, will retain the presidency. If six or more are false, then the opposition party will get the presidency. Alan Lichtman, who I have mentioned in previous videos, and who is probably getting dragged pretty significantly nowadays, created these keys using historical data for essentially every presidency we've had in America. And I'll be honest, I find these keys, the entire system, fantastically predictive. I think it's a wonderfully accurate system if applied correctly, which unfortunately in both the 2016 and 2024 election, Alan Lichtman did not apply them correctly. He gave a bunch of keys to the incumbent party that they did not deserve, and he unfortunately also misrepresented Trump in some of the keys that he was, you know, denied. But let's go through all of them one by one. The first key is party mandate. After the midterm elections, the incumbent party holds more seats in the U.S. House of Representatives than after the previous midterm elections. Now, in midterm elections, the current party in power tends to lose seats. Not always, but it does happen. So, in two years, one would actually probably expect the Republicans to lose seats in the House, as we've just spoken about recently. Currently, you know, there was a giant red wave, and the Republicans took power in the Senate, in the presidency, and in the House. They should have a majority in all three of those places. That being said, in this election, I believe the Democrats technically caught this key. I actually don't really know if that bad. But this is something that is, again, this is a very measurable, quantifiable result that you can simply just look at historical facts and figures and assign it 100% accurately to whichever party. So this is, a, this is a wonderful predictor. So Alan Lichtman could not have gotten this wrong unless he just Googled the wrong numbers. This is a 100% always going to be accurate prediction. No primary contest. Number two, there is no serious contest for the incumbent party nomination. Now, this one is actually a little bit subjective. I mean, just look at the wording. There is no serious content contest for the incumbent party nomination. Well, maybe there's a contest, but it's, ah, it's a foregone conclusion. It's no big deal. That's a possibility. And maybe then you'd say, yeah, there was no real primary contest. So we would say this is a true statement and therefore the incumbents are absolutely favored in that key. In 
this specific scenario, I think you could probably say, you know what, there was not a, you know, brokered convention, there was not any kind of really serious, you know, knives drawn, bloody political fight as to who would be the nominee, but, to be honest, Biden was the candidate until, all of a sudden, Harris is. There was clearly some behind-the-scenes stuff going on that I would say very possibly, actually, you know, would suggest that there was, you know, a contested nomination. You know, there was some kind of a fight, even if it didn't happen in the public sphere. It was not 100% for sure who the candidate was going to be. And this is evidenced by the fact that she was put in in the last minute. So number two, I'm pretty sure Alan Lichtman definitely gave this to the incumbents, but that's really not necessarily the case. That's a really gray area. In fact, I would probably maybe even, you know, give it a little bit to the Republicans. So, so far we've got one definite, true, We've got one, maybe true, maybe false. Number three, the incumbent seeking re-election. The incumbent party candidate is the sitting president. This is, according to the strict wording, this is not the case. So that would have to be false, which means it would favor the Republicans. But maybe you say, hey, it's not the sitting president, but it is the sitting president, vice president. You know, it's basically, yeah, kind of could be one way or the other, but taking the strict wording, we'll say false. So, so far, we're, we're at a dead heat, if not a Republican advantage. Four, no third party. There is no significant third party or independent campaign. I'm actually pretty sure Alan Lichtman, again, gave this to the Democrats. This was absolutely not the case. The significant third party candidate was RFK Jr. And he absolutely did run a significant campaign where there was, you know, he did hold something around like five percentage of the votes, which was easily enough to sway the election one way or the other. A spoiler candidate. That is essentially what we're looking at. So you can think of sort of like the, uh, the Bob Dole, Clinton, thing with uh, Ross Perot. Ross Perot was a third party candidate, and while he would not have won, he absolutely took enough votes from Bob Dole to guarantee Clinton the election. So in this scenario, we would say, no, this is also false. So far, we've got two for Trump, one for Harris, and one that, but to be honest, you could kind of say is for Trump as well. So that's three, maybe. And again, six or more, the opposition party wins. All right, number five, strong short-term economy. The economy is not in recession during the election campaign. Now, technically, recession is a specific, quantifiable economic term. If you are, like, you know, three quarters of, you know, GDP negative, something, 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 something specific, but basically that's what it is. Arguably, arguably, it's actually the perception, and not necessarily the numbers, but the perception of this. This is similar to number six, strong long-term economy. Real per capita economic growth during the term equals or exceeds mean growth during the previous two terms. Now, this is straight numbers. Let's go ahead and we'll be, you know what, let's be generous. We could say at least one of these, maybe even both of these, we'll say Harris. All right, so we're tied up three to three.
number seven, major policy change. The incumbent administration affects major changes in national policy. To be honest, this is something that I can't say. Now again, this is something that would be uh, subjective. What do you see as a major policy change? I can't think of anything under the Biden-Harris administration that was a real major policy change. I can't think of one. You could think of Obama, Obamacare. That was arguably a major policy change. I can see that. There was nothing like that under the Biden-Harris regime. So I would have to say this is false. So now it's 4-3. No social unrest. There is no sustained social unrest during the term. Now what do we mean by social unrest? Does that mean, you know, riots every month? Does that mean, you know, massive protests akin to, you know, the Vietnam era, Vietnam War era, you know, protests, all kinds of that stuff? Or does it mean, you know, a general feeling of like, ugh, things aren't really going that great? What about, you know, Twitter? social media is that where the social unrest is maybe it's not you know cap maybe it's not you know turning into you know on the streets protests but it's all kinds of stuff online maybe that's again that's subjective this is a subjective thing yeah like maybe it's some social unrest but it's not sustained i think most people would say you know what yeah the country the last four years has felt really uneasy, really, like, tense. We're not really sure, uh, you know, in terms of, like, maybe, you know, uh, illegal migration. I think a lot of people were very concerned about that. That felt like a, you know, serious issue. So I would maybe give that one to Trump. I would, it would be more likely Trump than Harris in that one. But we'll leave it off. So we'll say it's still retaining four to three, maybe five to three. No scandal. Number nine. The incumbent administration is untainted by major scandal. This is absolutely not true. This is absolutely not true. There were plenty of scandals. Uh, you know, in the Biden-Harris administration, there were... You know, a number of things like uh, cocaine being found in the White House. That was weird. There was, you know, the fact of, you know, Biden's mental decline being showcased on the debate stage. How long was that happening? Why did you cover that up? Who knew about it? How long did they know about it? That's a major scandal. So that one you'd go, okay, no scandal. There's definitely been some scandals. So, you kind of got to give that one to Trump. So let's say, for the sake of being, you know, generous, we'll say that's just five. We'll say that's just five keys in terms of Trump. Okay. So not six, but... leaning towards you know opposition party getting in number 10 no foreign or military failure the incumbent administration suffers no major failure in foreign or military affairs this one is kind of obvious again You'd have to say there have been some, you know, foreign policy issues. There have been some 
military failures, the withdrawal of Afghanistan, I really don't think you can look at that and say, oh, that was successful, even if you agree with it, which I do. I think, yeah, I'm, I think it's a great idea to get out of it. Afghanistan. I think that was a good move. The way in which it happened, though, you really can't say that was anything but a failure. So that's an issue. Foreign policy-wise, I mean, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, Gaza, all of that type of stuff, they're not necessarily huge failures, but they're certainly, you know, failed opportunities for success. So, I mean, this is kind of difficult to say anything other than, yeah, you'd probably give this one to Trump as well major foreign or military success. The incumbent administration achieves a major success in foreign or military affairs. This is definitely false. This is definitely false. So, that's what? Seven? In favor of Trump, he only needs six. He's got seven so far. But again, maybe, no. Number 12, this is the one, these are the two that are most subjective and the ones where I think Lichtman in 2016 actually did fumble. He actually did throw the uh, prediction because of these, because I remember the other keys being very close. It was, you know, like right down the middle. This is where he messed up. But all right, number 12 is charismatic incumbent. The incumbent party candidate is charismatic or a national hero. In this case, in the 2024 election, the party candidate, incumbent party candidate is Harris. So are they charismatic or a national hero? This, I think, is one where you have to look at the popular perception of them. Harris, while you might like the way she speaks, and you might personally get revved up from her rhetoric, she was not commonly viewed as a charismatic figure. She was generally speaking derided as like a poor speaker, didn't really do interviews very well, did not uh, get you know the turnout that Trump did, all of these types of things that would go, no. Nah. You know, not necessarily hated figure, but not somebody who's really incredibly charismatic, a la a Obama in uh, 2008. Obama 2008, very charismatic. Perceived. Number 13, uncharismatic challenger. The challenging party candidate is not charismatic or a national hero. Now, you can say what you want about Trump. You don't like him. You don't like his rhetoric. Unfortunately, amongst the general populace, he is viewed as a charismatic individual. Even people that are like, I don't like him. He's horrible. He's evil. Even they will admit, you know what? He does have a little bit of something here and there. He's charming. He's, you know, personally, I don't find him charismatic. Personally, I don't. I do not find him charismatic. I don't like the way that he talks. It's just aesthetically displeasing for me. I don't like it. But I would be a fool if I were to say he's he does not get this key. He's an uncharismatic. No, of course not. Of course not. So now, if I'm counting these up. The keys are somewhere along the lines of like eight or nine for Trump, in my recollection, in my, you know, working through of this. Which means, what, four or five for Harris? That's a blowout. And we see that reflected in the election and the results of the election. Lichtman had it the other way around. He had it, I think it was literally nine, yes, I think it was literally nine keys for Harris, and then, what, like four?
four for Trump. So, I mean, yeah, he was like, oh, there's no possible way she could lose. That's not the problem with his system. It's the problem with how he allocates them. Because a lot of these are, like, to a degree, to a, to a significant degree, they are subjective. But I do think these keys are actually a really good predictor if you can, you know, kind of get out of the matrix. You know, you can pull yourself out of the moral matrix of, you know, who is charismatic, who's not, you know, the sort of binary view of the world and, you know, really look at things from a strange outsider, non-human perspective, which obviously is almost impossible to do, but if you want to be predicting these things, it's a good way to do it. Alright, so what do you think? Let me know in the comments if you think these are good predictors or bad, if you've even heard about this guy before. Thank you for your time and attention. Good luck in all your endeavors. And I shall say farewell for now.